All right, geothermal students, Jonathan Bow here. Another topic nine. Wow, look, we're just ripping through this course. And I uh, hope you got to take a look at some of the drilling applications, the, the fracturing, horizontal drilling. But uh, news flash, you know, the tectonics, the big uh, tectonics driven by geothermal heat from the mantle of the earth. The news flash, Afghanistan. Did you see that? Afghanistan had an earthquake, 7.7 .7 on a Richter scale. Actually, it was the 26th. Uh, I get mixed up with the international dateline and all that. But let's take a look at what's going on over there. This time was having felt across the north, Haryana, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, where we're getting reports of uh, quite serious tremors there in our Delhi studios, which are on the second floor in Greater Kalash itself. How's your uh, Indian? There were tremors that we could feel in terms of the equipment, all the cameras and the, the lights, which were shaking for, I would buy uh, just an estimate, say about three minutes. and get you more information on where exactly the epicenter is. Uh, but those major tremors felt across the north of India. Jammu and Kashmir, some, some major tremors felt as well as Punjab, Himachal Pradesh. Tremors have been felt across the north, Haryana, Punjab. Here's the, the locals' opinion. Powerful 7.5 earthquake that's just hit near the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Strong tremors were felt through much of South Asia, including Kabul, New Delhi, and Islamabad. We'll go there now with our correspondent, Taha Siddiqui. Taha, you yourself felt those tremors just within the past hour. What more can you tell us? Well, uh, as, as you mentioned that uh, this earthquake happened almost uh, 40 to 50 minutes ago, uh, they, it lasted for more than uh, 150 seconds as far as we do know. And the Pakistan earthquake. Meteorological Department has said that on, on its Richter scale, it was measured as, at 8.1. Uh, 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 whereas we do know that from the U U.S. Uh, Geological Survey that it was 7.7. .7. Uh, now we are getting reports uh, from different parts of the country uh, of already of injuries. Uh, we already have uh, two confirmed uh, deaths uh, from uh, the northern Pakistan area uh, and, and two from uh, uh, around about 150 kilometers outside Islamabad. There's a small city called Char Sadda where two more uh, reports of two more deaths have been occurred. So all together right now the death toll that we have received is of four uh, people uh, having died in this earthquake uh, and uh, dozens of others injured. Uh, but these are very initial figures uh, right now from the government sources and the, uh, the civil defense uh, authorities which are actually uh, have started the rescue operation uh, they're saying that uh, the injuries and the casualties could go up uh, there are reports of multiple reports of uh, buildings collapses in the northern parts of area uh, uh, all throughout this is the same belt that uh, there was a major earthquake in 2005 uh, 10 years ago in Pakistan and this is the same belt where this uh, this earthquake has struck uh, but this time around uh, they uh, from the reports that we're getting from the meteorology department they're saying that the depth of the earthquake was uh, uh, more than 190 kilometers uh, uh, below surface and last time it was uh, le less than 19 kilometers and because of which uh, the destruction this time could be expected much lower uh, but at the same time uh, the civil defense authorities have said that uh, we would be expecting more aftershocks in the next 24 hours uh, and uh, the casualties could go up as I mentioned before uh, as uh, they tabulate in the coming hours. All right, Taha, thank you for that. That's Taha Siddiqui reporting there from Islamabad on that earthquake that hit uh, earlier today, an earthquake uh, that's at a magnitude of 7.5. Let's take a look at this. Wow.
three, four minutes long. Checking it out. So you've got your Iris Earthquake app. Let's take a look at that. Maybe we haven't looked at the Iris Earthquake app yet, but let's do that right now. We've looked at the USGS. This is kind of a cool one here. But, uh, you can see this is the United States, and we're looking at what kind of earthquakes we've had recently. Magnitude over here, magnitude 9, 8, 7. So you can see there's been some stuff going on right here. What do we got? Western Idaho, 2.7. Uh, that was the 25th also, wasn't it? Same date. 10.25, well, yeah, I think, I forget now, are, are they, let's see, are they ahead of us over in Afghanistan? Or is that, are they behind us? I forget which way the earth's rotating, but it's uh, this is the 19th here in Yellowstone region, 2.4 on the Richter scale. So you kind of wonder, and you know, here's that the Snake River rift, right? It comes ripping right in through here, and right there. Let's see what this one is all about. Okay, I can make that a little bit bigger, maybe. Ten twenty six today, huh? Magnitude three. Hmm. hmm. Let's select a new region. Select region. Let's get rid of this real quick. So I've zoomed out on the iris application here. And you can see North America is the selected region right now, but if we get over here and take a look at Let's see if that gets it right there. Aha. Kush Afghanistan. This is a 4.7, so it's settling down over there. It's going a little bit. Well, they're just getting hammered, aren't they? So you see the transverse faults here, and then the depth was what saved them, I think. This one here, indicating it was 150 to 300 kilometers in depth. The purple guys are a lot shallower, huh? Doesn't really show you that you know, the USGS tells you how deep it was. Not seeing the big one yet, though. There goes 7.5. Magnitude 7.5. 212 kilometers. Hmm. So all of a sudden, Kapow, huh? But uh, there's our earthquake, that Iris earthquake browser, which you know, we use it in geothermal. This is just kind of fun and games right here, but 
It is related to the tectonics, uh, the, the ring of fire here. It's a sub sub fault. As we zoom out of there, Pacific Ring of Fire. There it is, huh? I guess that's as far as it goes. Then you got the Himalayas and all that, Nepal and all that stuff in India. Very active region over here. 27th again, 4.2. Boy, that place is just getting hammered right now. 7.5. This was the 26th, okay. And then current 4.7 aftershock well I, you know the problem is the construction over there the, you weaken the, the buildings and then 4.7 is worse than the initial because you know the blocks are balancing on an angle and then a little shake and they come down but, um, definitely looking at 300 plus casualties at this point See what our USGS has to say about this Afghanistan. Let's get out here. Oh, let's do this. It's a little different. Zoomed out here. This is the USGS application that you have, or that you can acquire. Download the website So according to the USGS, things are slowing down. It's not nearly as loaded as the uh, IRIS website. It's interesting too that some of the uh, video I was listening to on the, the uh, from the New Delhi and that area, they were saying that it was eight point something on the Richter scale, but I don't see any eight point quakes anywhere here. Just in the last day. Yeah. Wonder what the last older. That's not good. Let's get rid of this real quick. Think here we go. So it's not showing anything down in there now. It's just for the last week. Here we go. Four point seven, so it's calming down, thank goodness. But this uh is gonna serve us as far as looking at the United States, huh? <coughs> and See what we got. It's not much happening over here. Let's get more current with it. There we go. A little more active. See if they got the ones that we saw. To all below 2.1 on the Richter scale. Butte, Montana. Cory Blast. How about that? How about that? They, 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 they it registered a Cory Blast. Unbelievable. Okay. There's that's our neck of the woods, huh? 
Is that the same one? Alright, let's look at this one. Lima, 1.3. But thank goodness there's no big one going on. This, some of this stuff down here they're trying to say is associated with fracking. It, That's current right there, isn't it? Just some fun to have for you when you're wondering what's going on with earthquakes. These. So there's a train of thought that says that earthquakes are, uh, in, you know, intensified by fracking techniques. Uh, they are. That's how they determine the size of uh, the. Uh, Reservoirs is with micro seismicity, huh? Listening to the earth, listening to where it's cracking and what the sounds are. And we're going to look at seismicity in the future here. But, uh, let's take a look now at uh, some more of this, the drilling techniques. This geopilot steerable drilling. <clears throat> the thriller of the driller. Here we go. Geopilot Rotary Steerable System As part of the pilot fleet of automated drilling systems, the Geopilot is the industry's most proven point-to-the-bit rotary steerable system. Azimuthal gamma and inclination sensors just one meter from the bit provide tight control on well bore placement and geosteering. The bit is pointed by flexing the internal drive shaft. The advanced geospan downlinking system provides total control while on bottom drilling without interrupting the drilling process. The shaft is flexed using a pair of eccentric rings controlled by a gear and clutch system. This design is capable of over 12,000 possible settings generating up to 6 degrees per 30 meter dog legs and makes the geopilot virtually immune to formation tendencies. The system is designed to exploit the proven benefits of extended gauge bits. Low well bore friction, improved hole cleaning, low vibration and longer bit life. This makes the Geopilot ideal for drilling extended reach wells and ultra long horizontal sections through the reservoir for maximizing production. The Geopilot is also excellent for open hole side tracks from existing wells. It is well suited to drilling everything from simple wells to the most complex 3D well designs, such as connecting multiple marginal targets for higher recovery. Successful in a wide range of applications from ultra deep water to advanced geo steering to vertical performance drilling, the Geopilot consistently rises to the challenge and reduces drilling time and cost. For maximum drilling efficiency and precise well bore placement, Look to the Geopilot Rotary Steerable System. That's one of my favorite uh, mechanical systems right there. These are, these are some larger systems coming up here. We're going to. So it doesn't do you much good to be able to steer your drilling rig the head at your uh, cutting head if you don't know what you're looking for so so when we get the idea sensors Halliburton's a pretty big name huh with ever increasing drilling rig rates as high as one million dollars per day there is significant value in reducing trips for wireline sampling tools the Sperry Drilling Geotap IDS Fluid Identification and Sampling While Drilling Sensor does just that, eliminating the need for wireline sample tests, thus reducing the long pump-out times associated with obtaining clean wireline samples. Multiple fluid samples are... And you see, this is uh, not just to show you how, how, th how these drilling rigs work, but there's, it's another uh, job opportunity, it's another facet of geothermal or drilling obtained within hours rather than days of drilling the formation. As the well is drilled, the Geotap IDS sensor is positioned in the logging while drilling bottom hole assembly, 
It may be placed anywhere in the BHA, but typically it is right above the formation evaluation sensor most critical to identifying the potential reservoir that will require further evaluation. As the bit penetrates the target formation, invasion from the drilling fluid occurs along the wellbore. Invasion continues and deepens as long as the hole remains open. These invasive mud filtrates are undesirable for accurate reservoir analysis and must be removed in order to obtain a clean, uncontaminated fluid sample. Typically, a sample should have less than 5% contamination. Run in the drilling BHA, the GeoTap IDS sensor has the advantage of near real-time sampling, which greatly reduces formation cleanup time because less formation damage has occurred from invasion due to the short exposure time to the drilling fluids. Using LWD correlation measurements, Take a look at a deep water rig here. developer, the first in a series of three ultra-deep water semi-submersibles delivered to mass drilling between 2009 and 2010. The state-of-the-art design of the rigs was made in collaboration between mass drilling, Keppel Felt and marine structure consultants, based on input from customers and service providers to oil companies. The rigs are designed to operate in moderate mid-ocean conditions, in water depths of up to 10,000 feet and they are capable of drilling to a depth of 30,000 feet. They have been designed to drill in complete deep water wells and install subsea facilities with optimum efficiency. The rigs are dynamically positioned semi-submersible with eight 4 megawatt thrusters and have a transit speed of 7 knots. They also have eight anchor winches for use with a pre-laid mooring system. With a displacement of 53,000 metric tons at drilling draft and a variable deck load of 7,000 metric tons, the rigs have large storage capacities for the operator's consumables and also provide dedicated and optimized extensive deck space and layout for the operator's equipment. The design has been developed to deliver a safe, efficient and innovative high-end drilling tool to the industry. Mass drilling believes that the way to increase efficiency and safety is to increase the mechanization of the drilling process. Essential to this process is the selection and hiring of the correct personnel to operate the equipment. The senior crews for these rigs are involved 18 months in advance of the rig going to work in order to go through a vigorous training and familiarization process. Let us look at this rig in more detail. The central control room, or bridge, is located on top of the accommodation block. Dynamic positioning, ballast control and principal alarm monitoring is conducted from here. office space and conference facilities on the upper deck is available for the rig crew, the clients' representatives and third-party service companies. Accommodation is provided for 180 personnel, consisting of 10 single and 85 two-berth cabins. The five decks provide all the facilities you would expect of a floating hotel, including 270 square meters of recreational space. We'll now move our attention to the features for enhanced efficiency, starting out with the drill floor and tubular handling systems.
Within the derrick, there are two hoisting systems, the main and the auxiliary. The main line activity takes place on the right-hand side and the offline activity on the left-hand side. The derrick itself is rated to 3 million pounds combined load. The main hoisting system is outfitted with a 2 million pound capacity, while the auxiliary is rated to 1.5 million pounds. We have designed the rig to be able to achieve dual handling activities. As seen here, this means that, for instance, while tripping with the main system, casing for the next step of the operation can be made up and racked back in the low setback area by the crew working with the auxiliary. Tripping drill pipe on the main well center requires no crew member contact with any of the moving machinery. The two vertical pipe rackers which allow the concurrent activities are controlled from the driller's control room by two drillers and their assistants. The senior team works the main system which is on the right as we are now looking at the drill floor. The tubular setback area is outside the derrick and drill floor on the cellar deck which provides a greater pipe setback capacity and a lower center of gravity. There is in excess of 50,000 feet setback capacity for drill pipe and we can rack from 16 inch casing to 7 inch liner with capacity for 15,000 feet or 7 inch liner. Here we can see the pipe being delivered from its storage area at the aft of the drill floor. It is a safe and efficient system controlled and monitored by the assistant driller by means of a CCTV system while the driller is running the pipe into the well. The casing has been made up and racked on the port off side of the drill floor ready to be run in stands of three joints saving makeup time when it is to be run into the well. The two drill crews are going to be constantly active as are the maintenance crews who will be following Mass Drilling's preventative maintenance systems thus ensuring the equipment is always ready to deliver high performance. The mud system has been designed to allow mixing and handling of two fluids simultaneously. This will reduce the time taken to change from water-based mud to oil-based mud, for example. The solids control system consists of eight shale shakers split into two banks of four. We are able to install cuttings dryers and centrifuges for zero discharge operations when required and as mentioned before there is ample deck space and storage capacity for any combination of cuttings handling and disposal. We have a fluid surface capacity of 1500 cubic meters amongst the largest of any semi-submersible. Four 2200 horsepower mud pumps rated to 7500 psi are provided for optimum hydraulics and to minimize downtime. There are storage tanks in the pontoon for weighted liquid mud, brine, base oil and fuel oil. Large capacity for bulk material is also provided in the columns for a total of 1,360 cubic meters. The 18 and 3 quarter inch 15,000 psi BOP has two annulars and six ram preventers. The lower ram can be configured as a test ram. BOP, the breakout or blowout prevention device. The one that didn't work in the Gulf, you know, in that oil rig. The unit has a multiplex control system with redundancy to allow both pods to operate with one fiber optic cable. The riser is stored vertically forward of the drill floor and we're able to store 9,600 feet. We see the riser handling crane delivering the 75-foot clip riser joints to the drill floor handling system where a double is being prepared to be connected to the BOP. Here we can see the riser running tool being remotely made up to the riser joint. So just a quick word on that, that's a bayonet a connector as opposed to the, the, the spin twist. We saw the threaded connectors that we saw, you know, some of the older equipment, so they, in that smaller GRD system, um, that was also a bayonet. The riser guidance arm centralizes the riser joint over the riser spider. Here we are 
looking at the moon pool area. This large moon pool also gives the flexibility for multiple activities. The BUP carrier moves to well center. The riser is lowered onto and connected to the BOP. The underhull guides are used to secure the BOP before it is run into the water. Final checks are made prior to running the BOP and riser into the water. The riser is made up with clip connectors. From stab to makeup of the connector takes 12 seconds. This represents a considerable time saving in comparison to other marine riser connectors available in the market. The riser string has now been run and the riser gas handler is now installed. This tool will allow the riser above the BOP rams to be circulated to the choke manifold and mud gas separator in the event of a well influx reaching above the BOP. The slip joint is equipped with a remote operated pull-in system that greatly enhances the safe and efficient handling of the kill and choke hoses and mud boost lines. Work baskets installed in the moon pool area and capable of traversing the length of the moon pool assist with the safe operations over water, significantly reducing the requirement for man-riding winch operations. The 4.2 million pound N-line riser tensioner system is secured to the riser string. This system has a 2 million pound trip saver feature, which allows a wet parking position for the BOP and riser string if required. The port side crane is a heave compensated crane with a capacity of 165 metric tons when used for cargo handling. The crane is rated to 100 metric tons in a 10,000 feet water depth. The knuckle boom crane situated at the aft of the rig is used to supply tubulars and equipment to the upper pipe deck and elevated catwalk area. A large number of the lifts can be accomplished without assistance from the deck crew, thus greatly enhancing the safety. The starboard crane is a conventional deck crane which is also able to work on the BOP when the BOP is stored on deck. It has a 165 foot boom length, a 60 ton rating at minimum radius on the main block and 15 ton rating on the whip line. We have simulated loading the rig for typical well situations and for envisaged situations. As illustrated, we can see the rig loading up with some completion equipment. On the port side of the rig, we can accommodate multiple subsea trees and accessories, which can be easily brought on board the rig using the subsea crane. As this rig has been designed for multiple subsea developments, the large staging area is matched with a large capacity in the moon pool for handling subsea trees and accessories. Subsea equipment can be deployed to the seabed using the main well center and the subsea crane. The subsea trees and equipment are moved from the staging area into the moon pool. Equipment can then be stacked up on the tree cart. The cart has 230 metric ton capacity and large vertical clearances to handle vertical or horizontal subsea tree systems. 
Additional space and clearance are provided for deployment of external control systems and other circulating lines. Whilst most of the work can be carried out within the handrails, work baskets aid the safe operations in this area. It cuts back on the manpower required also. There is 17 meters of available build height from the tree carrier to the underside of the overhead crane. With the available build height and carrier capacity for tree, LRP and EDP can be stacked up and tested prior to deployment. So you see the control turret here. So a lot the line of sight is not necessary for a lot of the control that they, uh, over the machines, they use uh, cameras. And Once the tree has been built using the bridge crane and the moon pool, it can be moved to drill center in preparation for deployment. The casing sleeve is lifted to allow this. A number of external electrical, hydraulic and or control lines may be attached to the production tubing and tubing hanger running tool or the subsurface test tree. We will use the deck above the main drawer works to provide space for the full range of the related equipment. Some of the numbers that you want to think about here, that, you know, they're talking about 10,000 water, 10,000 foot water depth, and then the ability to drill another 30,000 feet, so 40,000 feet of cable there. The production riser is now attached. The moon pool trolley is retracted and the subsea tree is run from the main well center. Subsea completions involve a substantial amount of additional equipment and services, including completion fluids. And something you might want to notice too that this is this rig is not it's not moored. It's actually you, you saw the uh, fan props that uh, were keeping it in position. Well test equipment, stimulation, wire line, coil tubing, downhole tubing, and accessories. The large usable deck space on the rig provides the capability to load all of these items on board. After consultation, special attention has been given to third-party equipment and services. Specific areas of deck have been identified for particular placement of equipment. For example, the selected location of the coil tubing unit has been deck strengthened to support the largest coil tubing unit available in the market. Modeling has been carried out to ensure that clashing is avoided when entering wire line or coil tubing to the rig floor. I mean cable when they say wire. The heave compensating crane allows an additional capability for deploying subsea equipment to the seabed. This unique feature will improve efficiency for multiple well developments. Because of the complexity of subsea completion operations, two ROVs are often used. The main work class ROV is within the structure of the rig with its own moon pool. When installed, a second work class ROV can be deployed from the aft end of the rig. Guided launching systems are provided for each ROV to allow deployment and recovery in high currents and heavy sea states. So what they're talking about then is if the, you get a 100 foot swell or something, which you, know, you try not to, but they just disconnect and then they can come back and reconnect. So that they're not trying to you know, fight the ocean with, by hanging onto that pipe. <laughs> they, they, they let, they'll let go if they have to. And that, that rig, I don't know, I guess th there have been some big enough seas that they actually had to evacuate one of those rigs not too long ago.
We believe that we have designed a rig to optimize deep water drilling and development activities. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present Maersk Drilling's new ultra deep water development semi submersibles. So they're not specifically saying it's for oil or gas or whatever, but uh, uh, in my mind, these guys go out, they set up the infrastructure, they get the, the uh, reservoir we've got in this case, a, a good source of circulable fluids, the ocean itself right there, and that you can circulate down through there, and then set up your uh, underwater uh, turbine assemblies, which would not be affected by uh, the surface, the you know the storms and stuff. So the the future for geothermal underwaters is bright. That that would be these guys do all the work. They get the oil out, and then we come in there and harvest the heat that's left behind. That's basically undepletable. So that that probably is what we'll see pretty quick here.